Please be seated. Welcome to all of you, whether you're here physically or joining us via Zoom. And a special welcome to anyone who is here for the first time. Our service today is led by the Reverend David Spears, and it includes covenant service and holy communion. And we do ask God's blessing on you, David, as you lead us in worship today. There are a few additional notes that I've got, which you, if you can bear with me while I quickly go through those. Firstly, a reminder that there's no service here next Sunday morning. We will be worshipping with our friends at the on the dream as part of the uh, prayer community. And just a reminder that the service there starts at 10 o'clock. So uh, maybe we've got to uh, get up a little bit early in the morning next week. And then the week after next, a reminder that uh, we'll be meeting not here but in, in the hall upstairs for a relatively short service led by the LRW team. And then following that, there will be a meeting uh, and, and total journeying together. Everyone has hopefully received a booklet or email, or if you haven't got it, there's some uh, hard copies available, which details some of the things we talked about in way back in October, and basically where as a church we go from here. So it's important that you do look at that and if possible, attend a meeting in two weeks time. Also a reminder that the funeral for Brenda Winterburn takes place on Thursday the 19th of January at three o'clock at Nen Valley Crematorium, Wellingborough. If anyone would like to go and need to live, then please see either Catherine Bruce or Lois Lees. And another funeral is the service for Alan Core. But so for Alan Core is on Wednesday the 20th of January, again at Nen Valley Crematorium. So please again, please see Catherine Bruce if you need a lift for that one. And finally, those of you that were here on January the 1st, I know a number of us were at Park Avenue, but those of the who were here know that Martin Turnbull uh, spoke about prayers and said there would be some paperwork available. That is now on the table at the back if anybody needs. Thank you for your patience in all those additional notices. And thank you, David. Thank you, Trevor. The Lord be with you. As Trevor said, this is a service of Holy Communion. Um, Holy Communion will occur in the usual way, but for those of you who do not know what the usual way is, um, we will celebrate the liturgy and then um, the bread will be distributed to you by the deacons and stewards where you are sitting. You will eat the bread immediately on receiving it, but when you receive uh, the wine, uh, we invite you to just hold it and we will consume the wine together. And if you don't wish uh, to receive uh, the elements, um, please just keep your hands by your side, but otherwise put them out. Uh, and the wine is non-alcoholic as well. Let's begin our service with a moment of quiet so we can be aware of God's presence amongst us, holding us in love and drawing us closer to his son, Jesus our friend and saviour. Gracious God, you who created us, you who preserves us and you who sustains and redeems us, we thank you that you have drawn us together this morning to hear your word, to receive the sacrament, and to know you better 
And so during this worship, we pray that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit and that you remind us of your promises made in Jesus. And we ask that during this time that we spend with you and with each other, that our hearts might be warmed and that we might grow in faith to be more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 493 in Songs of Fellowship, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. And I thought I would try a little experiment this morning. <laughs> I make everyone nervous now. I'm going to divide you down the middle where the cross is. If you're not sure where you are, pick a side. And on the, this side of the church, we're going to start off by singing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But on this side, you'll remain silent. And then when we finish and get to the hallelujahs, you're going to start saying, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then at the end, we're all going to join in one final verse of hallelujahs. And it will be around. Well, that's the theory. <laughs> Let's give it a go. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Please stand if you're able to do so. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And he is right.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Holy and gracious God, parent to all of creation, we give you praise. For you are the one who has made us. You are the one who has given us life in all its fullness. And you are the one who through Christ has made a covenant with us, a promise that you will never, ever separate yourself from us or your love. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who came down from heaven to be amongst and with us and to show us the way of your love, the way that leads to the cross and to the resurrection. And we praise you too for your Holy Spirit, who is with us now, who guides us and challenges us and enables us to be your holy people here on earth. And yet, gracious God, we forget all these things. We forget that you are the one who helps us. And we try to help ourselves. We are self-centered. We break our promises and we do not love you or our neighbor as we ought to. And so in the silence of this moment, we offer up our confessions to you admitting our fault in what we have said and done and in what we have failed to say and do. And we ask for your forgiveness. Merciful God, you are slow to anger yet you are quick to forgive. And through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, we have been forgiven, for we have been cleansed by his sacrifice. We have been cleansed by his blood and we have been renewed by the spirit that proceeds from you and your son. And so we pray that you will keep us on the right path, that we will keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and that we will be led by the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Service today we are celebrating is about renewing our promises and this morning many of you would have brought a promise with you what's he talking about well many of you might have a banknote in your wallet and a banknote is made of polymer it's a kind of plastic and on the front you will see that this banknote is worth 20 pounds and right on the, at the top, you will notice some very, very small words that says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £20. And so this is what we call a promissory note, because it's worth more than the polymer that it has been printed on. It has a value. It has a value because it's backed up by the Bank of England, an authority. And it also has a value because it bears the image of our late Queen Elizabeth II. We too are worth far more than simply the sum 
of our parts. We too bear an image, that is the image and likeness of God. All of us who are made in that image bear God's image and likeness. And we have a great worth as well. And that worth is revealed in the promises of God. The promise of Jesus who came to be our saviour, to die for us, to be raised for us so we might have eternal life. So all of you brought a promissory note. Well, maybe, maybe some of you haven't got a promissory note this morning. But all of you come with a promise that is inherent in the fact that we have been made in God's image and that Christ has died for us. And so we're going to have some readings now from the Bible. The first from the book of Deuteronomy, which talks about the covenant relationship the ancient Jewish people have with God. And then from the Gospel of John about the disciples' first calling. And these readings will be read to us by David and Ray. Yes, the Old Testament uh, reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, and we begin at verse 10. Today, you are standing in the presence of the Lord your God, all of you. Your leaders, your officials, your men, women, and children, and the foreigners who live among the unpetrol wood and carry water for you. You are here today to enter into this covenant that the Lord your God is making you and to accept its obligation. So that the Lord may show no now to burn you with this people. Be your God as He promised you and your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are not the only ones who think the Lord is making this covenant with its obligations. He's making it with all of us who stand here in His presence today, and also with our descendants. New Testament reading from John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. First thing in the first part is the Lamb of God. Next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, There is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about, and I said, A man is coming after me. But he is greater than I, because he sees me before I was born. I did not know who he would be, but I came to capture him. The second part of the reading is of the first disciples of Jesus. The next day, John was standing there again to the disciples. And he saw Jesus walking by. There is the Lamb of God. Two disciples showed the saints and they were with Jesus. When Jesus turned, he saw them following him. Oh, what are you looking for? They asked, Where do you live? That one. This word means teacher. Come and see the answer. Was then about four o'clock in the afternoon. So they went with him, saw where he lived, 
steps of everyday life. One of them was Andy, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, In the name of Simon, the son of God, if you would be called to speak, Simon Peter means a lot. There is the best of you. When we talk about covenants, we can sometimes be misled into thinking that covenants are about exclusivity, keeping people in and keeping others out. But the covenant which God made with his people was always intended to bring others to God. Israel was to become a light to all the nations. And the same is with the new covenant that is made with us through Jesus. We are called to be a community of welcome and inclusion where others can find the love of God. And so I'm going to show you a short video now, and it's from a place I used to, to be in, in Hull, my former appointment, and a place called Selby Street Mission. And it's just a short video about how they live together as a covenant community, and in so doing, bring others into relationship with God and each other. I come to Selby Street Mission because it is the, uh, the heart of our community in this area. It really feels the pulse. I come to Selby Street for protection and for people to see me for me. Silver Street's in the Boulevard, which was a very prosperous area linked to the fishing industry. And over time, uh, it became abandoned as, as the fishing industry declined. When I was gambling, I was in a bad, dark place and I was a lonely person and, and not many friends. And I just enjoy coming. It's just a, a warm place where you can meet different people and who've been in the situation or, or have had problems with alcohol or drugs. People are drawn to this place uh, because they want to serve uh, the church on the margins. They want to share the good news. And we've got a real eclectic mix of people, which is amazing. And uh, it's just God's calling upon our lives. And I think we must be doing this as a church. People can come and have a cup of tea or coffee. Also, the rugs, we were in a food bank where you can get 10 items for a pound and also the clothes bank, which helps people out in these difficult times with the cost of living crisis. It's one of the poorest areas in the whole country. I keep coming because it's the people and it's the prayers and it's the presence of other people at 17 years, the way you are. I have found friends here. That was the reason I keep coming back. They are like my family. My family is here, and that's what keeps me coming to the church. And as far as finding my faith, I think I wanted to find it for a long time. It took me a long time to find it, but when I went not on my door, I know that that's what it was doing. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, may the words from my lips and the meditations of all your heart, all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is the biggest transition that you have made so far in your life? When I was younger, the big transitions in my life all about going through the education system uh, from infant school to junior school and then to secondary school. In fact, I still vividly remember uh, my first day at secondary school, uh, getting lost in the corridors, not being able to find my way to class and then getting into trouble from it. And then I remember vividly too, my first day at university, um, lining up for registration and my first 
lecture. In more recent years, transitions for me have involved moving job, moving house, even getting married. And yet transitions are never easy things because they involve you going from one state, one place to another place. For the ancient Jewish people, the transition from Egypt to wilderness to promised land was not an easy one. Indeed, there were times when the covenanted people wandering in the wilderness would look back to Egypt and say, well, can't we just go back there? And can't things be like the way we used to know? But no, God had a different path and a different future for them. Because change and transition is a natural thing. It's part of growth. It's something that we all have to go through. And it's important that we mark the milestones in those transitions so that we can see when significant change is happening, but also the direction of travel that we're going in. Now, the reading that we have this morning taken from John's Gospel is an example of a transition moment. John the Baptist, that wild man who ate locusts and honey in the wilderness, started a movement. A movement of people who were coming to him to be baptized, to repent of their sins, and to prepare for the coming kingdom of God. Yet now John announces to his followers and disciples, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John points to Jesus and he confirms who Jesus is, the one who the prophets before him foretold, the son of God who is to save them. And in doing so, John encourages his disciples to move away from him and to instead follow Jesus. He recognizes that his role was a temporary one, that he was part of a transitional movement to prepare the way for an eternal kingdom in Christ, so that when the Messiah appeared, his followers would go to him. This says a lot about John's character, doesn't it? About his understanding of who he is, of what his calling is. And John is very clear here that he hasn't built this movement up to be about himself. His participation in the work of God has not been about fulfilling his own wants and desires. No, instead, John has come to help those around him transition into something even greater. The discipleship of John leading in to the discipleship of Jesus. And the arrival of Jesus on the scene at his baptism and then the beginnings of his ministry was a time when John had to let go and be willing for something new to happen in the one who he had laid the path for, for Jesus Christ. For Simon too, in the passage that we heard, there is a new name. A new name, Peter, meaning rock or stone. Here, Jesus is sealing Peter's new identity in him and telling him through the name that he's given that one day he will be the one, the rock, on which the church would be built. This receiving of a new name was part of the transition of a new identity. This morning, we come together to participate in a covenant service in which we affirm the relationship that we have with God and the promises that are given to us in Christ. Now, many of you might not be aware of what this strange thing is, the covenant service, but it was popularized in the 18th century by John Wesley, who encouraged the then Methodist people to make a renewing of their promises in the new year. 
And the reason why Wesley did this was because he believed that the covenant was fundamental to our understanding of what it means to be a disciple. That the relationship that we have with God was akin to a marriage between human beings, with humanity on one side and with God in Christ on the other. Indeed, the original covenant prayer sounded very much like a marriage service. Taking Christ as my head and husband for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for all times and conditions to honour and obey before others and until death. And yet, while the language of the prayer has changed from its 18th century iteration, the understanding that this is about an important relationship still continues. And like any marriage, and this is something that I'm growing and learning in, it needs to be worked on. It needs an openness. It needs an openness to the gifts and blessings that can come through that distinct relationship and how together we can grow in love, understanding and maturity. And that was important for Wesley because he wanted those who are part of this new movement to grow in their relationship to, with Christ, to understand what it means to be in relationship with God and with each other. Because it spoke to his own experience of his relationship with God, where his heart was warmed by the promises of Christ. But the process didn't end with the covenant. The idea was that at the beginning of the year, this new commitment to God would inspire a new way of working for the kingdom. And all of this occurred within the context of the 18th century revival. This year is the 250th anniversary of the hymn Amazing Grace. It celebrates the sermon by John Newton, who preached those first words from the pulpit. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, but bl uh, blind, but now I see. And Newton went on a similar journey to Wesley. Early in his life, he joined the Navy and then was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. And then during a storm on a ship, he found the renewal of his faith. And then in time, he became ordained as a minister in the Church of England and would go on to become an abolitionist to campaign and fight against the very trade he was involved with. And like Wesley, Newton could point to milestones in his life where God made changes in him that gradually led to him being a new person in God. Embracing a new and transformed life. Of rejecting his old way of being to a new way of being in Jesus. Now, the question is for us as Christians living here in the 21st century in Kingsthorpe is can we make the transition from the former things and the temporary things to the eternal things? As we make our covenant promises today, we do so hoping that they will help us in the growth that we have with God. Not because of any power that we have in making these promises, but the power of God that is given to us in the Holy Spirit that God will lead us, transform us, and give us the newness of life in his son. That we too can discover the amazing grace of God that will affect us and make us more like Jesus. John the Baptist came to point the way to Christ because he knew 
what Christ was here to do. He knew that the Lamb of God would take on the sins of the world, that he would set his people free and that he would give them newness of life. The question is, are we too prepared to accept that? Not only to accept, but to follow Jesus wherever he will lead us. Are we prepared to go where Jesus will take us to new places and new people? And are we prepared to open our lives to new relationships? When I was training to be a, a local preacher, I lived in Devon. And the wonderful thing about living in Devon is you're always close to the sea. Um, not so much here in Northampton. The sea is something I really miss. But I loved going to those little fishing villages by the sea where you could see the boats in the harbour and the boats in dry dock being worked on. And it was always a wonderful sight to see the boats in the harbour. But the wonderful thing is, is that the boats were not built to remain in the harbour. That once every day they would go out into the open sea to fish and then come home to bring the catch. And being in covenant and community is a lot like that. We were not built to remain in the harbour, but we are built to be sent out into the world to share the good news of Jesus. And that's what Jesus was doing when he picked those fishermen to follow him, that they weren't just going to stay by the seashore, but they were going to go out into a new mission field and to bring in a new harvest and so I thought I'd end this talk this morning by sharing with you a little video it's a song called we are not made for the harbour but we are made for the sea it's a reminder that as we renew our covenant together God doesn't want us to stay static in one place but he wants us to move with him to new places, to new people, to share the gospel of his love. We are not made for the harbor, we are made for the sea. Oh, at times it's wild and cold and dark, it's where we're meant to be. And the launch is half as a battle, though we may be tossed about, but your presence is Storm that walls us in, calls us out. You left a safe for to heaven for the elements of earth. This God at risk exposed. Lift our eyes to horizons where that heaven rushes earth and this born world is transformed. We are not made for the we are made for the sea. Though at times it's wild and cold and dark, it's where we're meant to be. And launch us out as a light, though we may be tossed to proud. But your presence in the storm it calls us in, calls us out. You sent us out to the market, sent us out to the field. Jesus, hope and mass. Take no purse for the journey, but take your authority to the care that all is yours. We are not made for the heart, we are made for the sea. Though at times it's wild and cold and dark, it's where we're meant to be. And launch us out as a battle, though we may be tossed about. But your presence in this storm, it walls us in. And calls us out I'm to the office Leaving his mark I'm to the factory His spirit the spark I'm to the school gates And out to the bars May we risk What was never ours
We are not made for the harvest, we are made for the sea. No, at times it's wild and cold and dark. It's where we're meant to be. You launch yourself as a fire, and we may be tossed about. But your presence in the storm, it calls us in and calls us out. We are not made for the harvest. And so we sing our next hymn, number 19 in Songs of Fellowship, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sight. Please be seated. 
come now to our time of thanksgiving. And at this point, I thought I would open it up to you. What are the things that you're thankful for this morning? What are the things you're thankful for this morning? The fact that the rain has stopped, (laughs) that the sun is shining once again. Well, let's give thanks for the sun that shines for us and for all people. Anything else we should be thankful for this morning? Coming back to church. Hmm. So coming back to church and the comfort and sustenance that God gives us. Good health. The family. The what, sorry? The things are for peace. Anything else? Thanks for faith. And for each other. For love. For God's love. Okay. Let's bring all of those things to God in thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that you are the one that created all things, the sun that shines in the sky, and that you are the one who is the source of our health and comfort and all that sustains us. And so we thank you for all the good things that you give us, for our friends and family, for the fellowship that we can enjoy here, for the peace that you offer us in the storms of life that passes all understanding. We thank you for the love that you have for us in Christ, a love so strong that we can never be separated from it. And we thank you for our faith, however small it might be, because it is our faith that gives us hope that the world can be transformed by your love. And so we pray that in love and faith and in fellowship, that as your family here on earth, siblings to one another, we might continue to follow Jesus to keep giving thanks for all the good things he gives us and for all that gives us life. Gracious God, help us. We pray, give us courage and enable us to grow with you and with each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we sing again, hymn number 120. Him that reminds us of that call to follow Jesus. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Should your life 
seated. Now we were going to sing the, uh, the Wesleyan Covenant hymn at this point, but I'm going to suggest we move straight now to the Covenant Liturgy, if that's all right, and share the promises. There we go. So sisters and brothers in Christ, let us again accept our place within this covenant that God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us and the call to love and to serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy and some are difficult. Some bring honour and others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests Others are in a contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves, yet in others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. And yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own, let us give ourselves to him, trusting and promising his promises and relying on his grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to be in gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. And in obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. And with joy, we offer ourselves anew to you for we are no longer our own, but yours. And if you wish to join in the prayer, I invite, if you're able, to stand and repeat the words on the screen. I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things, wherever you may place me, in all that I do, and in all that I may endure, when there is work for me and when there is none, when I am troubled and when I am at peace, your will be done. When I am valued and when I am disregarded, when I find fulfillment and when it is lacking, when I have all things and when I have nothing, I willingly offer all I have and am to serve you and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and mine and yours. May it be so forever. And may this covenant I made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> As we have entered into this covenant, not for ourselves alone, but as servants and witnesses of God, let us pray for the church and for the world. Loving God, hear us as we pray for your holy and Catholic church. Make us all one that the world may believe. Inspire and lead all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world establish justice and peace among all people. Have compassion on those who suffer from any sickness, grief or trouble. Deliver them from their distress. We praise you for all your saints who have entered your eternal glory. Bring us all to share in your heavenly kingdom. And let us pray in silence for our own needs and for those of others. Lord our God, you have helped us by your grace to make these prayers, and you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord that where two or three agree in his name, you will grant what they ask. And so answer now your servants' prayers according to their needs. In this world, grant that we may truly know you, and in the world to come, graciously give us eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so the risen Lord Jesus stood amongst his disciples and said, peace be with you. And so may the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to turn around to your neighbours, to smile, perhaps, maybe to wave just as a reminder that we all share the peace amongst one another and we're held in the love of God. And so we sing together our communion hymn, Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away. Please stand if you're able. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share. So we share. Thank you. 
the saviour of the world. Sharing our human nature, he was born of Mary and baptised in the Jordan, and he proclaimed your kingdom by word and deed and was put to death upon the cross. Yet you raised him up from the dead, you have exalted him in glory, and through him you have sent your Holy Spirit, calling us to be your people, a community of faith. Therefore, with all the angels and the archangel angels and the choir and company of heaven, we join in the triumphant hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, we praise you that on the night that he was betrayed, our saviour Christ took bread. He gave you thanks, and then he offered it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup of wine. He gave thanks, and then he offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we do do this, remembering therefore his death and his resurrection and proclaiming his eternal sacrifice as we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving as we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send down your Holy Spirit, God, on us now and on these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and the blood of our Saviour Christ, and unite us with him forever, bringing us with the whole of creation into your eternal kingdom. For we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in the one bread. So Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. And so we share the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God.
of Christ shed for us may keep us in eternal life. say together we thank you Lord that you have fed us in this sacrament united us with Christ and given us a foretaste of a heavenly banquet prepared for all people amen thank you and we give thanks for all God's good gifts and we offer the gifts that we have given during this service and the end of this service to the work of this church through our retiring collection. And we close our service in song. Love divine, or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Keep us in thy humble dwelling, or thy faithful mercy's crown. Hymn number 377 in Songs of Fellowship. <laughs>
And so we go into God's world in the knowledge of his presence, in the promises of his son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so may the blessings of God, of Father, of Son, and of Holy Spirit, be with us and all whom we love, and those whom we ought to love, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen.